Hey there, this is Chris Clements. Welcome to a podcast on The Mole. If you're not familiar with enhanced podcasts, you'll get uh, fr- get pretty uh, acquainted with this. So let me explain a little bit, because a lot of you who are listening to this have never probably watched an enhanced podcast. First of all, I make these sitting in front of my iMac at home. You may hear kitty cats in the background. You may hear telephone in the background. I cannot silence everything in my environment. So just giggle when you hear that. The idea here is that I make a podcast, which of course is an audio track that you listen to, but it's enhanced in that I take my PowerPoint slides and I convert them into JPEGs, an image format. I then drag each image to the appropriate time point in my audio track that I've recorded. I label each time point where a new slide pops up as a chapter marker so that you don't have to scrub your way through the audio track just dragging a slider along to pick the point where you want. When you are on your own and coming back to listen to this for some reiteration of things that I've taught you, then you can go into chapter mode in iTunes and you can choose a chapter that you want to listen to. You don't have to listen to the whole podcast or you don't have to scrub your way through it. If you're not using iTunes and you're using QuickTime, those are your two choices, both of which are free downloads. If you're using QuickTime, there's a little down po- downward pointing arrow that is the chapter marker. So it doesn't say chapter like it does in iTunes, but uh, the way to get these is to subscribe to them so that you can get updates on them. Okie dokie. Sometimes you have to go looking for them on my website, but hope you enjoy them. So let's go ahead and get started with the concept of a mole. You've probably heard of a mole, and yes, a mole can be a burrowing critter. It can be a skin pigmentation on those of us who are fairly skinned. We might have several of them. It can even be a spy. But in chemistry, we're looking forward to learning about a mole that is none of those three. In chemistry, a mole is a word that brings to mind a very large number. It's a word that represents a number. Rather like when I say we have a dozen of whatever. It can be donuts. It can be pencils. It can be students, whatever the noun is that dozen is describing. It is a word that represents the number 12. I believe each of us knows that. Well, after this podcast, you very well might remember that a mole is a word that means 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever we're talking about. Well, to put that in more chemical terms, a mole of any substance is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power representative particles of that particular substance. This enormous number, I mean just think about that, 10 to the 23rd power. 10 to the 3rd is a thousand, 10 to the 6th is a million, 10 to the 9th is a billion, 10 to the 12th is a trillion, and so on and so on. You get the idea, it's an enormous number. That number is also known as Avogadro's number. A gentleman named Amadeo Avogadro is who did a lot of work determining the numbers of particles that were present in equal volumes of gases under static pressure and temperature conditions. You'll learn about him a little bit later, hopefully, when you get to gas laws. Rest assured that he did not count any (laughs) particles out at 6.02 times 10 to the 20 third of those particles. My goodness, that would have taken him his whole life, wouldn't it have? So the number is named Avogadro's number in honor of the work that he did. It is an extrapolated value, which means that it's not literally counted. It is uh, reasoned that this is the number of particles based upon counting a smaller sample than this particle uh, number of particles would yield. So before I really get started on the remainder of this, let's talk about this number and how you put this into a calculator because you're going to be doing a lot of this later on. So I need you to turn your calculator on and I want you to input what I tell you as I tell you to do so. 
do not jump ahead, do not think you know what you're doing, and be a little smarty pants and uh, show off. Let's do this all together. I want you to type in 6.02 and I want you to pause. I do not ever want you to type in times 10. On scientific calculators, you'll have a function known as exponential notation. That exponential notation button saves your typing in times 10 and avoids your typing in times 10 and getting errors that are very, very, very easy to make as you do this. So now on your screen you have 6.02. I want you to look for a button that reads EE, two uppercase E's, oftentimes it is a second function on a calculator, or look for a button that says EXP. Oftentimes that EXP button is down by the Enter button. Once you find that button, I want you to make it so, as Jean-Luc Picard would say, and type in the EE or EXP, meaning just punch that button. Some calculators at this point are just going to have a blinking cursor. Some are going to have a couple of zeros that pop up. Some are going to have an E with a blinking cursor. Some are going to have a little bitty times 10 as a superscript that pops up or as something off to the right side that pops up and then a cursor. What you've just done is told the calculator that you want 6.02 to be multiplied by 10 to some power and what the calculator is now asking you is what is that power. So again your calculator is going to read 6.02 and then any of those iterations that I just gave you. The cursor is waiting for you to tell it the power of 10. Well the power of 10 is 23. I then want you to type times 2 and then enter or equals. You should see on your calculator screen 1.204 and then depending upon the previous screen it's going to say e to the 24th or have a space and have 2, 4 or have a little bitty times 10 or a decent size times 10, 2, 4 or as a little superscript, 2, 4. You need to learn to read the calculator in scientific notation and you do not write what the calculator gives you unless it says times 10. We always write scientific notation as we see it on this screen right now. 6.02 literally times 10 to the 23rd power. We never type it into the screen of the calculator as times 10. So if you did not get 1.204 times 10 to the 24th on your calculator, we need to make sure you can and that means stop the podcast and practice this. You have got to be able to do this to go any further. Okay, if you ended up pausing and you're coming back, let's move on. And remember I said that a mole of any substance is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd representative particles of that substance. Well, that should bring us to a little concept of G. What is a representative particle? something you may or may not have heard before. Well, a representative particle is the smallest part of a substance that still represents that substance. It depends on what the substance is as to what the representative particle is called. Thus, we have to be able to classify substances. So we have three classifications of substances. They can be elements, molecular compounds, or ionic compounds. If we're talking about an element, I want you to look at your periodic table. Everything on that periodic table is indeed an element, but there are seven elements on that periodic table that do not exist by themselves in nature. They exist as diatomic molecules, which means when they're written by themselves, they always have a subscript of two. There's a silly little mnemonic device that I teach my students that is Brinkelhoff. It is no one's name. It simply represents the seven elements, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Now, if you look at the periodic table, start at nitrogen, move over to oxygen, to fluorine, and down to iodine, 
you see that they make, as you draw your hand along those, a number seven. But there are only six elements there. So then your brain has to remember, oh, there's a hydrogen. That goofy little element hydrogen that, ooh, is so prevalent everywhere is also one of these. So you can use either of those methods to help you remember what the diatomic elements are. So what I'm getting at here is that anything on the periodic table that is not one of those seven diatomic molecules is considered an element for our purposes. And you'll hear a kitty cat in a minute. He's coming in. The other two types of substances are molecular compounds and ionic compounds. Well, we need to be able to classify the differences between the two. A molecular compound is made of two or more nonmetals. And that means you need to be able to look at a periodic table and determine where the nonmetals are. You should have learned at this point where the semi-metal line, little stair-step line, or the metalloid line, both names are appropriate, is on the periodic table. And you should have learned at this point that metals live to the left of that semi-metal line. Non-metals live to the right of it. Those that live along that line are the semi-metals or metalloids. With a few exceptions, meaning aluminum lives on the line, but certainly aluminum is considered a metal because it has such strong metallic properties. Okay, that means when you look up a molecular compound, you've got to recognize that it's made of two or more non-metals. Some examples, if you just look at the non-metals on your periodic table, are carbon dioxide, water. Now, gee, I threw that one in there because hydrogen is not to the right of the semi-metals. It is indeed to the left, but it, being its goofy little self, is weird. And it is indeed a non-metal that happens to live over with all of the metals. So you consider hydrogen to be a non-metal. So again, carbon dioxide and water, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur trioxide, and any of those seven diatomic molecules. So Br2, I2, N2, Cl2, H2, O2, F2. All of those are examples of molecular compounds. Ionic compounds are made of a metal and a non-metal that have bonded, or we can look at an ionic compound as containing at least one polyatomic ion. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about polyatomic ions and can recognize them. So some examples of ionic compounds. I look on the left side of the stair-step line and on the right side and pick a metal and pick a non-metal. So of course everybody always likes to choose NaCl. Mm-hmm, yeah, I know, it's boring. So let's get a little more exciting. Let's try making something like magnesium oxide. It's MgO. Magnesium is a metal, oxygen is a non-metal. How about copper 2 sulfide, CuS. Copper is a metal, sulfur is a non-metal. If I look at polyatomic ions, I can make an ionic compound out of a bunch of non-metals because they can behave as polyatomic ions. For example, ammonium, mm, let's say sulfate. Its formula is parentheses NH4, parentheses 2, SO4. It's made of a whole bunch of non-metals. Every element in that compound is a non-metal. But it's classified as an ionic compound because it is made of polyatomic, what's the key word? Ions. Okie dokie. So that's how we identify our substances. Now what we go to after we recognize what a substance is, is determining what its representative particle is. So I've given you this handy little chart here that tells you that a substance can be classified as an element, molecular compound, or ionic compound. And then I break it down into the smallest particle that still represents that substance. Well, when I look at an element, if I tell you I have some gold, well, a sample of gold, regardless of whether it's a ring, a coin, a chunk, whatever it is, a sample of gold is made up of gold atoms. And what we get from piecing this information we've learned so far is that when I have one mole of gold, I will have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of gold. Now, I can certainly get smaller than an atom. 
You've learned that, what atoms are made of, protons, neutrons, electrons, and even smaller parts. But if I get smaller than that atom, I'm not representing the atom anymore. I'm representing part of the atom. And therefore, I'm not representing the element anymore. So if, for example, I pull a proton off of gold, well, gee, I have a proton from gold, but that proton by itself is not representative of gold. So we don't get smaller bits than atoms in chemistry. In nuclear chemistry, we can, but still they're not representative of the smallest point of, of the element, per se. When I look at a molecular compound, for example, carbon dioxide, CO2, a sample of carbon dioxide, if you exhale into a balloon, you exhale more than carbon dioxide, you exhale some nitrogen, some oxygen, some argon, mm -hmm, yeah, all that fun stuff, some H2O in the form of water vapor, but let's say you exhale pure CO2 by some miracle. If you exhaled a mole of CO2, which is pretty hard to do by the way, we'll get to that a little bit later, you would indeed have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of CO2 because the molecule is the smallest part of a molecular compound that is still the compound. So when I have one molecule of carbon dioxide, I have one CO2. Now, that CO2 can be broken down into smaller parts. They're still not representative of the whole, but they can be broken down by smaller parts using chemical means. So I can break apart carbon dioxide, and when I do, think about it, carbon dioxide, CO2, every time I have one molecule of CO2, I will have four, excuse me, I misspoke, I'm looking at a page, I will have one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms every time I have one molecule of CO2. Well, what if I had 10 molecules of CO2? Well, gee, I would just distribute that 10, and I'd have 10 atoms of carbon and 20 atoms of oxygen. And then we have our third type of substance, the ionic compound made of a metal and a nonmetal, or at least one polyatomic ion. And the smallest part of an ionic compound that still represents it is called a formula unit. When you have a mole of sodium chloride, you will have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of sodium chloride. Yes, that sodium chloride can be broken down into smaller parts. And when I look at one formula unit of sodium chloride, NaCl, I see that I have one Na ion and one Cl ion. That's from my subscripts. Well, what if I have, uh, let's see, Mg3, uh, As, well, if I happen to have that, it means that when I have one formula unit of Mg3As2, I will have three magnesium ions and two arsenide ions. Okay, I'm going to reiterate this as I go through. We're going to go through several, several processes here. All right, so again, when I have a mole of iron, that mole of iron contains 6.02 times 2 to the 23rd atoms of iron. Why? Because iron is an element, and the representative particle of an element is the atom. When I have a mole of bromine, that mole of bromine contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of bromine. Why? It is a molecular compound made of two nonmetals that are bonded, thus molecule is its representative particle. And again, when I have a mole of sodium chloride, it contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of sodium chloride because it is an ionic compound made of a metal and nonmetal. When I have a mole of sulfur trioxide, SO3, it contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of sulfur trioxide because SO3 is made of nonmetals. It is a molecular compound. When I have a mole of Na2O, sodium oxide, it contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of Na2O. Because it is an ionic compound made of a metal and a nonmetal. 
And I want you to look at every one of these that is written on this particular picture. I have a number, a unit, and a substance. Those three components are critical from here on out. You must have a number, a unit, and a substance. So let's start with, gee, my lines are all out of whack here. I'm going to try to go back and fix that for you. I thought I had, but, oh well, willing suspension of disbelief here. We make this information useful when we, <laughs> that one is messed up, isn't it? Just move those lines so that they separate mole from what's beneath it. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So we make this information useful by understanding from the previous slide that I can say one mole of Fe over 6.02 times 10 23rd atoms of Fe. What that's doing is giving me a conversion factor. Do you remember earlier in the year you worked on conversion factors? You converted things like maybe kilometers to miles or uh, grams to kilograms. When you do so, you use dimensional analysis, and yep, that sucker's coming back to haunt you. So, you can say one mole of Fe over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of Fe because we know that they are equal to each other. One mole of Fe equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of Fe is how we read that particular uh, ratio that we've been given there. Again, Forgive my lines, but as I move down the page, I have one mole of Br2 over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of Br2. Notice how I abbreviate molecule. I have one mole of NaCl over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of NaCl. Notice how I abbreviate formula unit. One mole of SO3 over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of SO3. One mole of Na2O over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of Na2O. Now watch what I can do on the next slide. Again, screwed up lines, just forgive me for that. I can flip them. Because they're equalities, I can write them the first way or the second way. I can say 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of iron over one mole of iron, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of bromine over one mole of bromine or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of NaCl over one mole of NaCl, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of SO3 over one mole of SO3, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of Na2O over one mole of Na2O. Are you getting that number in your head yet? I think I've said it probably, who knows, 40 times so far. Okay, when we look at smaller bits, as I indicated with the CO2 earlier and with the NaCl, it only is done so for molecules and formula units. So if I go for smaller bits, I can look at one molecule of Br2 and say it has two atoms of Br. Now I can do that same ratio setup that I did before. One molecule of Br2 over two atoms of Br, or two atoms of Br over one molecule of Br2. Notice atoms is not Br2, it's just Br. You cannot have diatomic atoms, you can only have diatomic molecules. I can have one formula unit of NaCl, as I've previously discussed, that has one sodium ion. Notice I've put the charge of the sodium. And one chloride ion. Notice I've put the charge of the chloride ion. Na1 positive, Cl1 negative, with your charge, number, and then sign. You ought to be able to look on a periodic table at this point in your chemistry careers and determine the charges of sodium and chloride ions. I got my numbers one from my subscripts that are understood in the formula NaCl. And I can write a whole set of equalities here as ratios. One Na ion over one formula unit of NaCl, or one formula unit of NaCl over one Na one positive ion. One Cl one negative ion over one formula unit of NaCl, or one formula unit of NaCl over one Cl one negative ion. So I don't have to look at both ions. I can pull one out and ignore the other. When I look at a molecule of SO3, I see that there is one sulfur atom and there are three oxygen atoms. So again, setting up my ratios, a molecule of SO3 over one sulfur atom or one sulfur atom over a molecule of SO3. A molecule of SO3 over three oxygen atoms or three oxygen atoms over a molecule of SO3. 
one formula unit of Na2O, as you see, has two sodium ions and one oxide ion. Notice my charges. And that phone just keeps ringing if you can hear it. One formula unit of Na2O over two sodium ions, or two sodium ions over one formula unit of Na2O. One formula unit of Na2O over one oxide ion, or one oxide ion over one formula unit of Na2O. Okay, so now we need to move on to calculating molar mass. The molar mass is the mass of one mole of a substance. Remember, we have three types of substances. Element, molecular compound, or ionic compound. Calculating the mass of one mole of it requires that you use a periodic table because you need to use average atomic masses, the masses that are on the periodic table, and round their masses to the hundredths place just so we do all the same thing as what I ask you to do. The unit of molar mass is grams per mole. If you've done isotope problems before, you learned the unit of those average atomic masses to be atomic mass unit, or AMU. Well, one AMU is defined as one gram over one mole of that substance. So when I look up iron on the periodic table, I find it, I determine that its average atomic mass is 55.85 grams, and that means it is equal to one mole. So I can write it both ways, notice. But then I make it more useful by putting it in this ratio, this fraction, if you will. One mole of Fe over 55.85 grams of Fe, or 55.85 grams of Fe over one mole of Fe. It is helpful to be able to write it both ways, depending upon what kind of calculation you're doing. If I want to find the molar mass of a compound, I have to do a little more work, but still entails not much more than looking at the formula you have and looking at the periodic table for masses. For a compound, you're going to calculate the molar mass by writing down each element that's in the compound. In the case of Br2, we only have Br. We have a subscript of 2 there that tells us we have 2 Brs. I look up bromine on the periodic table and I see that its average atomic mass is 79.90. I multiply 2 by 79.90 since my subscript told me I had two bromines. And that tells me that the molar mass of Br2 is 159.80 grams per mole. Well, that means I can write it as one mole of Br2 over 159.80 grams of Br2 or 159.80 grams of Br2 over one mole of Br2. If I want to do a different sort of compound like NaCl, I notice that I have one sodium and one chlorine. I look up their average atomic masses. I see that sodium is 22.99 and chlorine is 35.45. I then get my extended values. And yes, I understand I only multiplied by one, but I'm still going to ask that as you do this, you show your extended values to make sure you've accounted for everything. And what I do at that point is add together my extended values. So I'm going to add 22.99 and 35.45 to get 58.44 grams per mole. Again, one mole of sodium chloride over 58.44 grams of sodium chloride or 58.44 grams of sodium chloride over one mole of sodium chloride. If I want to do something like sulfur trioxide, I have one sulfur and three oxygens. Sulfur, depending upon the periodic table you look at, can have an average atomic mass of 32.06 or some periodic table showed as 32.07. I'm using 06 here because that's what the periodic table I looked at had on it. And get my extension, take 3 multiplied by 16.00, 15.998 is what you see on most periodic tables for oxygen, round that to uh, the hundredths place and it gives you 16.00. My extended value, as you see, is 48.00. You see the importance of getting the extended value. I now add 32.06 to 48.00, and I get 80.06 grams per mole. And again, one mole of SO3 over 80.06 grams of SO3, or 80.06 grams of SO3 over one mole of SO3. If I want to do the molar mass of sodium oxide, I 
I look at my formula, I have two sodiums and one oxygen, so 2 times 22.99 equals 45.98, 1 times 16.00 equals 16.00. Add those two extended values and I get 61.98 grams per mole. Again, I can write it as one mole of Na2O over 61.98 grams of Na2O or 61.98 grams of Na2O over one mole of Na2O. If I want to use a compound that has a polyatomic ion in it, I need to recognize that the polyatomic ion has a subscript that is distributed through the parentheses on the polyatomic ion. So when I look at the formula of calcium hydroxide, I have Ca parentheses OH parentheses 2. That 2 is distributed through the parentheses so that I understand I have one calcium, two oxygens, and two hydrogens. I then look up their average atomic masses, so I multiply 1 by 40.08, and I get my extended 40.08. I multiply 2 by 16.00, get my extended 32.00 and multiply 2 by 1.01 .01 for hydrogen and get my extended 2.02. I add 40.08, 32.00, 2.02, and I get 74.10 grams per mole. And again, need to understand that I can write that as one mole of calcium hydroxide over 74.10 grams of calcium hydroxide or 74.10 grams of calcium hydroxide over one mole of calcium hydroxide. And finally, a big nasty one for you, the molar mass of magnesium acetate. As you look at that formula, you see that you have one magnesium. As you distribute your subscript of two outside of the parentheses, you see that you will have four carbons, six hydrogens, and four oxygens. You do the same looking up at the molar masses, the same extensions. If you need to pause it to check everything on here, go for it. And when I get my sum, I have 142.37 grams per mole, which again, I can write in either fashion as one mole of magnesium acetate over 142.37 grams of magnesium acetate or 142.37 grams of magnesium acetate over one mole of magnesium acetate. I want you to notice that in every one of these molar mass calculations, when I've shown you the ratio or the fraction. I have had a number, a unit, and a substance. Number, unit, substance. Every time you write a number, it will have a unit and a substance. Now I've given you a handy little chart that has mole as a central unit. And it, it kind of came out a little goofy. It has text box the little bracket thingies there. Ignore those. I had gotten rid of those and it apparently saved them for me. I then have extensions from mole of representative particle, gram, and liter. We are going to ignore liter for right now. Uh, you will come back to it when we get into uh, gas laws. So if you look at mole stretching out to representative particle, the reason that I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd out beside it is because in order for you to go from moles to representative particles, you must use 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I don't ever say you must multiply by or you must divide. It depends upon how you're doing it. I will tell you that you will never place a number next to mole other than one unless it is given information. In other words, one mole of whatever your substance is will have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd representative particles of that substance. You will never, I repeat, never put Avogadro's number next to mole. It always goes next to your representative particle. That number of moles would be absolutely too gargantuan for us to imagine. When you convert from moles to grams, I have molar mass written there because you need to be able to use molar mass, which has units of grams per mole, to go from moles to grams or grams to moles. That is why I showed you how to write them with moles on top or grams on top, either way. 
When you get to gas laws a little bit further along in chemistry, you'll learn how to convert from moles to liters using molar volume. But again, I don't want to go there. You can make an extension off of this chart if you wish to, in that you can take some representative particles and turn them into smaller bits. Remember, the only ones that you can do smaller bits on are the molecule and the formula unit. So if you want to draw another line coming off of representative particle, saying that you want to go to smaller bits, you will have to use subscripts, is what you would write out beside it. Knowing that elements will not have subscripts, only molecules, and formula units can have subscripts, and even formula units don't always have subscripts. Think of NaCl, subscripts are understood to be one. So don't let that confuse you. I'll work through several examples here that will make this hopefully a little easier on you. So as we put it all together, we're going to start working problems. I've shown you how to work these problems just as you should work them. I show you step by step, and you need to use these as your guideline for doing your work. You will have a practice sheet to do and you need to show every bit of work. So I've given you three practice problems on here that you will use as your guidelines. My first practice problem is how many atoms of helium are in 4.5 moles of helium? The first thing you need to consider is, is helium an element, a molecular compound, or an ionic compound? Your answer better be an element. So, since it is an element, you need to now determine what its representative particle is. Elements have atoms as their representative particles. Alright, now you use your given information to begin your dimensional analysis or unit conversion or factor label method. It has lots of different names. You are again always going to write a number, a unit, and a substance. You begin with your given information. As you look at the given information, how many atoms of helium are in 4.5 moles of helium? Well, your given information is 4.5 moles of helium. So you will start out writing 4.5 moles of HE. Notice it's already crossed out. Do not cross it out yet. You will then set up dimensional analysis where you say times and you draw a line so that you will have a numerator and a denominator. I stress that you always write your unit and substance before you ever write in a number when you're doing dimensional analysis. So we have 4.5 moles of HE and we want to know how many atoms of HE that is. Think about the handy little chart on the previous slide. Can I go directly from moles of helium to atoms of helium? I can because atom is the representative particle of helium. Had this been a molecular compound, I would have had to go to molecules and then atoms. Alright, so I am going to place mole of helium in my denominator, and I'm going to place atoms of helium in my numerator. And then I'm going to think about what numbers go where. Do you remember I told you you will always put one next to mole unless it is given information? Well, we put 4.5 next to mole of helium as given information. What are we going to put next to mole here? We're going to put 1. How many atoms are in 1 mole of helium? You should know the number by now, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of helium. Notice my moles of helium will divide out. If it helps you to see that, draw a line underneath 4.5 moles of helium and put a, just a 1, no unit, no substance under that, so that you can see that moles of helium will divide out. You will be left with atoms of helium. And in fact, when you do your calculation, 4.5 times 6.02 EE or EXP, 23, equals, you will get 2.71 times 10 to the 23rd, make sure you read your calculator properly, atoms of helium. All right, I do walk you through the steps of these, but I don't have the answer written up here because I want you all to get to a point where you get your answer, you compare your answers, you can stop the podcast while you're working and come back and I'll give you the answer. The problem is, 
If a sample of chlorine gas contains 2.97 times 10 to the 24th atoms of chlorine, notice it's written as Cl because they are atoms of chlorine, but chlorine gas does not exist as Cl. We'll talk about that in a moment. How many moles of chlorine gas are there? So we're asked to start with atoms and work our way toward moles. Is the chlorine gas an element, a molecular compound, or an ionic compound? Well, that should set off little alarms in your head that mm -hmm -hmm, chlorine's part of that Brinkelhoff business. It's a molecular compound. Since it's a molecular compound, its representative particle is indeed the, you got it, molecule. So I now want you to use your given information to begin your dimensional analysis. As always, number, unit, and substance will always appear. So we have given information of 2.97 times 10 to the 24th atoms of Cl. I cannot this time go directly from atoms to moles because I am not dealing with the representative particle of chlorine when I have been given 2.97 times 10 to the 24th atoms of chlorine. I am dealing with a smaller bit since the representative particle of chlorine gas is the molecule. So I'm going to go from atoms of Cl to molecules of Cl2. I will write atoms of Cl in my denominator and molecules, abbreviating it if you wish, of Cl2 in my numerator. I'm then going to put my numbers in place. Now this is where you make it easy on yourself. Every time you look at Cl2, how many atoms do you see? Well, you see two because you're looking at one molecule of Cl2. So put one next to molecule and two next to Cl. That comes from the subscript. Notice atoms of Cl will divide out. You then are left with molecules of Cl2. Well, that's not what we were asked to get. We were asked to determine how many moles of chlorine gas there are. So now can you convert molecules to moles? Indeed you can because molecule is the representative particle of chlorine gas. So put molecule of chlorine in your next denominator and mole of chlorine in your next numerator. What number goes next to mole? You got it. A one. You're staring at it. And what number goes next to molecule? You got it. You're staring at it. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, my suggestion as you calculate this is to type in your value 2.97 EE or EXP 24. And notice everything else in the numerator is a 1. Don't waste your time typing times 1. I think all of you know what times 1 does to something. Absolutely nothing. So I want you to press divided by and pay attention to this. This is a very, very handy little trick. You have parentheses on your calculator that you may or may not have ever used. I want you to open your parentheses. Use the left parentheses button and type 2 times 6.02 EE or EXP 23 and then close your parentheses. Use the right parentheses button and then press equals. If you need to stop, go back and go through that process again, please do so. And this is where I want you all to get your answer, compare with each other, see what you get. You can turn this podcast on pause if you wish to. When you come back, I'm going to tell you the answer. So if you're back, the answer is 2.47 moles of Cl2. Now notice I give you three significant figures in all of my answers because I give you three significant figures in my given information. I try to be very consistent with that. Okie dokie, you've done two of these problems so far. We're going to do a third one and then you're going to get time to practice for a couple of days. The third problem is how many sulfide ions are present in 10.0 grams of ferric sulfide. Again, you have to ask yourself, is ferric sulfide an element, a molecular compound, or an ionic compound? Well, it's made of ferric, which means it's iron, with a three positive charge, and sulfur, which is hmm, S2 negative, so we can kind of reason through the formula that way. It's a metal and a nonmetal, therefore it's an ionic compound. So our representative particle is the formula unit. Again, use your given information, write your number, unit, and substance throughout. You have 10 grams of ferric sulfide. 
So 10 grams of Fe2S3 is what I begin with. You should be proficient at writing formulas by now. In my first set of dimensional analysis, in my denominator, I want to divide out grams of Fe2S3 and turn them into something useful. I'm trying to go to sulfide ions. Now think about that. If I go to ions, hmm, I have to have gotten to ions from formula unit. Well, how do I get to a formula unit? Well, I get there from a mole. Well, how do I get to a mole from a gram? Yep, I use molar mass. So I'm going to put moles of Fe2S3 in my numerator. I'm going to calculate the molar mass of Fe2S3. Pause the podcast if you need to, to give yourself time to do so. You should verify what I have up here as 107.88 grams of Fe2S3 are present for every one mole of Fe2S3. Notice the grams will divide out. I'll be left with moles of Fe2S3. I then have to get rid of moles of Fe2S3 and turn them into, yep, here we go again, formula units of Fe2S3. What number am I going to put next to mole? You got it, a 1. I'm going to put 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd next to formula unit of Fe2S3. My moles of Fe2S3 then cancel or reduce or divide out, however you want to say it. And then I'm left with formula unit of Fe2S3. My lines look all screwed up again, sorry about that. I'm going to divide out the formula unit of Fe2S3 and turn it into ions of sulfur, sulfide. It's the only one that I was asked about, so I can ignore the iron. I don't have to worry about the Fe3 positive ion. I'm going to worry about the S2 negative ion. When I look at one formula of S Fe2S3, I see that S has a subscript of 3. That tells me that there are 3 ions for every one formula unit of sulfide. Now, if you want to type this one into your calculator, you're going to do 10 times, and look at everything in your numerator, 6.02 EE or EXP, 23 times 3. Notice I didn't use parentheses there because I'm in my numerator. I then hit equals, and if you want to stop and write that number down, that's fine. You don't have to hit equals, you can just press divided by. I only have one number in my denominator that I really care about, and that's the 207.88. So I'm going to divide my numerator product by 207.88, and I get 8.69 times 10 to the 22nd ions of sulfide. Again, 8.69 times 10 to the 22nd ions of sulfide. Okay, I've worked out three of these. The last two are very long compared to the first one. You don't necessarily have to do a whole lot of long ones. I have lots of practice, ten of them on a practice sheet for you if you're so interested. You can find it on my website. You can uh, be gifted it by your teacher who might make a copy for you. You just heard a cat tear off. And I hope that this helps you. I hope that you can come back to it and listen to certain parts of it again as I guide you through it. I apologize for the little line mistakes and for the kind of goofy looking business on the uh, handy chart, which might not have been there. I'm not real sure. Maybe I corrected all the line mistakes because I just realized I'm looking at the PowerPoint that I didn't correct and I corrected them for your slides. So maybe all that gobbledygook was for nothing. Oh, well, at least you're giggling by now, aren't you? Okay. Hey, I'm glad you are. Glad you're having fun in chemistry. Don't let anybody tell you chemistry's not fun because indeed it is. You ought to walk out of this room just grinning from ear to ear and people say, what's up? You say, I just, I just had chemistry. It's just delightful. Hee 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 hee. Hope it's the highlight of your day. Bye.